I'm Tamara Cherry, author of the Trauma Beat book and host of the Trauma Beat podcast. For this week's episode, my conversation with a longtime crime reporter on the heels of a trauma-filled court case. Here it is. Okay, so Michelle, why don't you just start out by introducing yourself? Sure. Um, My name is Michelle Molesky. I've been a reporter for 24 years uh, at uh, CHWI TV in Windsor. Uh, We were first the new WI and then A Channel and then A News. And uh, now we're CTV Windsor. And so uh, it's been a... um, I'm really lucky. I consider myself blessed to be able to do the same job for as long as I have in uh, in an industry that uh, is, it's a great job. It's the best job in the world, if you ask me. Yeah. And it is rare, Michelle, and I, you must Very. agree to come across <clears throat> reporters who have been in it that long, right? Because people get burnt out or laid off more often than not, or yeah. it's, it's not an easy industry. It, it isn't. And it's very unusual that I've been in the same job in the same community yes. at the same station. That part is rare. And I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I was in the right place at the right time. I came fresh out of school. I worked really hard to show them that this was what I wanted to do. I've wanted to do this since I was a teenager. And I was just in the right place at the right time. And I got into the industry when there was a lot of jobs, Mm. when like, I didn't even have an interview. I didn't have a demo tape. I didn't even have a resume for my first job. It was, Hey, we're starting this show in Windsor, a morning show. You know, we're comfortable with you. Now you've worked all summer for us. Do you want to move to Windsor? The only thing is it's 25 hours a week. And at the time I was in my twenties and I was like, well, I've never been to Windsor, Ontario. It's got a casino. It's got to be a cool place. (laughs) Literally that's, and then I moved here and started and my boyfriend at the time was also in London and he followed me here. And the rest, as they say, is history. We've both created a life here. All of our kids were born here. We've purchased two homes here. This is home now. So I'm very, very lucky. I didn't realize that you were from London. London, I'm not Ontario. actually. <laughs> okay, so you. I'm not you, actually. You had I went. London. Okay. Yeah, I went to school in London to Fanshawe, uh, uh-huh. big big supporter of Fanshawe College at the time when I was in high school. I wanted the best broadcast journalism program that I could find, and uh, from my you know, dial up computer back in the Ottawa Valley. I grew up born and raised, proud to be born and raised on a farm in the Ottawa Valley. And the first program that came up in my old school search and talking to my guidance counselors was Fanshawe College. And it was a rigorous progress, uh, rigorous process to get in. And I was thrilled to be accepted and loved my time in London. And uh, part of that program was um, a one-year co-op. Mm-hmm. And that transitioned into working uh, all summer, every other weekend, and every other week I was on afternoons, and that turned into my first job opportunity. Okay, all right. And and for for any of our listeners who are listening from outside of Canada or even outside of Ontario, um, mm-hmm. we're referring to London, Ontario, Ontario, not, <laughs> not London, England. Okay, no. so Michelle, uh, it, it struck me when you said that you knew you wanted to do this since you were a teenager. What was it about journalism that you were drawn to? Uh, The female anchor Mm -hmm. at the TV station back home, CHRO uh, in Pembroke, Ontario. Uh, It's now uh, affiliated with the Ottawa station, CTV News Ottawa. And Marianne Zadra, she was the female anchor. And we, you know, in those, in, in those days, there wasn't streaming. I know I'm dating myself here. In my days, there wasn't streaming either. Right. And we watched the news routinely as as a family, or it was just kind of on in the background after dinner when we would be doing the dishes. And um, I I remember, um, like, I don't remember thinking if she did it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. But I just never questioned that I couldn't. And so I totally agree with and support this whole idea that when you see yourself represented, You don't even question if it's possible. You just assume that it is, you know, it is, and you're young and, and you just think, Hey, 
And then the other thing that I like to tell people, and it's kind of embarrassing, but I'm also sort of proud of it, is I would then take the newspaper, the Pembroke Observer, and when no one else was in the house, and I would open it up and I would pretend to be Marianne Zadra and I would oh. read the articles to the oh wall. Oh my gosh, that is in the adorable. Kitchen. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, it was a lifelong goal to mm. get into news and, you know, really to be an anchor was the end goal. But then, I mean, I got into this business and I realized that I really like reporting. I like being out of the office mm -hmm. and yes. I do enjoy anchoring. I backfill at anchoring from time to time, but you're really just reading someone else's words mm -hmm. and you're not socializing with the community and on the ground, you're not getting your hands dirty in the actual mm -hmm. news gathering. And so I found an incredible mix you know, fast forward 24, 25 years this September, um, I found a great mix between I'm the assistant news director, I report every day, and I backfill as a producer and anchor and an assignment editor. So I'm again, I'm really lucky. I'm blessed. I yes. have my I have my hands in a lot of different yes. um, avenues. The moving in parts. This you're you're in mm -hmm. a little bit of ever. That's funny because you yeah. just reminded me that when I was like seven years old, my dream was to become a news anchor. Which is funny because Seven, if that's you would impressive. Have, well, no, but if you would have asked me like in my teens or anything like that, I, I like I had no aspirations to become a journalist. And in fact, when I went to university, I went I was in pre-pharmacy to begin with. And by the time wow. I switched to journalism, it was because I thought I would write for snowboarding magazines. I had no interest <laughs> in news. And then I fell in love with it through my first internship mm. at the Regina Leader Post. But isn't it funny how that happens? Um, and and, so and I funny, fell in love path. with being a newspaper reporter. You, I was like, you're not going to catch me dead in front of the camera. Of course, things <laughs> changed. That ended up happening. Anyway, okay, mm -hmm. so Michelle, um, the news hook, if we can call it that for our conversation today, is a trial and sentencing hearing that you've been covering for the last several months. Indeed, a case that you've been covering for much longer than that. Um, this is something that you volunteered for, and, and I want to drill into this trial in a bit, but first I want to, I, I just want to say like, you've covered a lot of trauma in the course of your career. Like you are, do you call yourself, I know you don't only cover crime in courts, but it, that is your, that is your wheelhouse, right? So tell me, tell me a little bit about that part of your career and, you know, how it brought you to volunteer for covering this trial, which we'll get into, but it was, it was a, it had a lot of trauma in it. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. I think we're all considered sort of general assignment reporters. And through the course of that, you do see all sorts of things. And, you know, I mean, I've forgotten most of it, you know, cause you just, you sort of put it aside. So the one thing that sort of jumped out at me was I did a ride along with uh, overnight two nights with um, a local crew of paramedics. And it was a feature that I really wanted to do because I thought, you know, when I go out and I get video of anything crime related, I always see police, I always see firefighters, I never see paramedics. By nature of what they do, their role is to get in there yeah. and get out. They're usually gone and by the time you arrive. But because by the time we're finding out about something, they are long gone, they're already at the hospital, they're offloading their patient, and they're ready to go to the next call. And I thought, there are people who really deserve um, attention, I think is the right way to put it. And when that was all over, and it was overnight, and granted, I was tired, I know that, we didn't see anything weirdly outrageous. Um, but we did go to what's called a VSA, a vital signs absent. And in that case, um, they asked me to stay in the ambulance because they knew it might be um, too aggressive for TV. And I was happy to agree, but I had wireless microphones on them and I could hear what was happening and I could hear what they were trying to do. And fast forward, they saved this person's life. The person was having a heart attack and the rapid action of the paramedic saved his life. And I don't have the video of it, but I can still hear their voices in my head about what they did and how um, exhilarating that was to have been there. And I, I went home that night and I started to think about these people are amazing. They just saved a person's life. That's not something to overlook. And I was so overcome with emotion by it. I did have a little breakdown and I had a little cry about 
what I had witnessed over 24 hours. Cause they did everything from, um, a mental health person who just needed to talk to somebody all the way up to saving someone's life, car accidents, a diabetic patient whose meds were messed up and just needed to kind of get back to where they, where they needed to be. And, um, I just, I, that was the first time in my career that I really stepped away and went, I just saw something. I just witnessed something. And then I have to try to translate that into news. And that was the first time in my career. And so I'm getting off topic here, but I, when, when I wanted was this, to illustrate- Michelle, when was that? 2015, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and then it, it, it morphed into like a five part series and wow. it, it was, I was so proud of it. And then I covered a trial um, and I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of it, but I struggled with that one too, because of the nature of the crime. And those were the two times that I really started to notice one. I like to show people the cold, hard truth of what some people in our community are doing every single day. And then I really enjoy court because of, for the same reason, there are people who have to deal with incredibly difficult things and they have to find a way to seek justice. And that's again, nothing to be overlooked. And I think that's when I started to get really interested in the court process because I like to argue, I like to debate, I like to talk about things with people. And that's really what the court process is all about. And so, yeah, I I have an interest in court. I have an interest in the law. And again, fast forward a couple of years, and I've covered lots of different kinds of cases, met lots of lawyers. Some were nice, some weren't, some are media friendly, some aren't. And then you get to know crown attorneys, you get to know judges, you get to know the system. And I find it's a challenge, Mm -hmm. unlike other assignments. I find it forces me to really think about every single word that I'm saying, because something really bad can happen if I report something I shouldn't. And I like that challenge after 24 years. The stakes are very high. There's legal states, but then there's also the stakes of, you know, the vulnerability of the people that you're reporting on, right? The families that are sitting in those courtrooms who are grieving. I know you and I have talked about this many times off air and we share that feeling, you know, that, that burden, that need to get, get it right for them while also reporting the facts that can be hard. So this, this case that, uh, that, that brought us to this conversation, Michelle, you know, I don't like naming mass killers, so I'm not going to name him. I'm fine with that. But we're talking about a case where there were four members of a family who were murdered, not because they, you know, not because they, they did anything or they said something or they gave somebody the wrong look. They were murdered because they were Muslim and only because they were Muslim. And there was a little boy who survived, uh, a member of the same family. And so this is a case where this man has been convicted of four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Can you tell me a little bit about what it's been like for you covering the trial and the sentencing hearing uh, in this case? Yeah, that's a hard thing to boil down. I'll quickly answer your previous question. Why did I volunteer for it? Because I was interested in it being, it was a huge story. It's a national story. It was bigger than London. It was bigger than the Muslim community. And uh, that interested me. And the fact that it got moved, the trial got moved from London two hours up the 401 down here to Windsor. Mm -hmm. That rarely happens. You know this. It's rare because that's just not how the court system works. But in because it had become so high profile, the judge was like, you know what, we got to get this out of London. And so they moved it to Windsor. And so looking back, Tamara, I naively just saw it as an interesting court case. And I'm, I'm glad I was naive because I don't regret it, but it changed me. And because it was such a big story, um, CTV London and CTV Windsor, and quite frankly, Bell Media made a decision that this was going to be something that we weren't going to pop in and pop out on as the media generally does because of declining resources. This was going to be an all or nothing thing. We were going to report on this every day, which is a career first for me. Mm -hmm. So for 11 weeks, I covered this trial. Um, I did not miss a day. My colleague, Nick Paparella in London, did not miss a day. Um, 
and, and I can honestly say that even on days when the jury wasn't there, we were listening because we wanted to know why isn't the jury hearing this? Because that's going to be important at the mm -hmm. end of all this. I found it. I was fine to be quite honest with you. I was fine because of the nature and because of the sensitivity of it, the judge, the defense lawyers, and the four crown attorneys wanted to shield the Windsor jury from those very graphic images. They saw no graphic images. They heard no graphic evidence. In fact, one police officer started to talk about what he was seeing and they stopped because they don't want to um, sensationalize the evidence because the jury has to weigh it based without emotion. They got to exactly. put emotion at the door. Based and on the facts, hard. not on the emotion. Yeah. Exactly. And when you say, I saw a woman and she looked like X, Y, Z, anyone goes, oh, I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. And so the, it was very, I don't want to say sanitized because that's, that implies that there was censorship and that the truth wasn't out there. It wasn't but they walked a fine line between glorifying or upsetting the jurors. The judge must have given them 10 instructions throughout 11 weeks to not let their, to put their emotion aside. It was when we got, quite frankly, when we got into the accused being on the stand and he was on the stand for about uh, eight days between direct cross and redirect and judges questions. And the accused blamed a whole host of issues but himself in a very cold and detached emotionless way i've seen accused grown men grown women sob on the stand while they talked about what they did and there was none of that again it was weird that he even testified in the first place but that's when it started to turn for me because after 8 days of blaming quite frankly, his mother, a lot of the blame he laid at his mother's shoulders. And as a mother, that doesn't sit well with me um, because it was over and over. She was strict. She was religious. She homeschooled. And then those things caused him to have mental illnesses and the mental illness caused him. And then the pandemic, he was isolated during the pandemic and he was going down dark holes on the internet and the dark web. And, and it just kept coming back to blaming the media, blaming his mom, blaming his upbringing, blaming his mother's religion. And, and even when he was in cross-examination, no, and I started it thinking, I just wanna give you a hug. You're so sad and you're so lost and you're 20 years old. And by the end of it, I was just, how could you have let yourself get to this point without talking to somebody, without saying, I'm not in a good place. And so that's when it started to turn for me. And talking to um, uh, Jane Sims, a uh, veteran, and I say that with respect, a veteran reporter with the London Free Press, she became a, a good friend. We chatted a lot when she would go back to London. We would, and there was one day where she was particularly upset. And I went home that night and I was, she's not right. And so I messaged her and just said, if you're not okay, call me. Here's my cell phone number. Let's talk about what we've witnessed because she had to report on this in her own community. I was struggling. It was just in our court in front of jurors she was struggling for so many other reasons and that's when it really turned for me and that's when I recognized that I was starting to be bothered by what I was hearing and then uh, he was convicted by the Windsor jury unanimously across the board which was a great day and the family very very bravely spoke about the importance of that very moving day difficult to talk about but one person talking with 25 people behind them. It was an incredible visual, a show of support and always talking to Mara about, we will not let this get us down. We will not let us, we will not let this change who we are and our religion and how we live our lives. And I was so buoyed by that, that justice has prevailed. And then we got to the sentencing hearing and it was two days. Again, you'll know unprecedented, 70, 70 victim impact statements. That's a lot. You know that from covering sure. court. That's a lot. Yeah.
We'll be right back. The first day wasn't too bad. It was family members, difficult to hear, very sad, gut wrenching, you know, so it would have been around six and a half hours of sadness, trauma, anger, and grief. And I, and I was, you know, a little down, a little blue, but I thought this is my job. This is what I'm here to do. The next day, I will never forget it. Three young girls, best friends of the 15 year old who were killed, wrote their victim impact statements, got up in that court at like 15. Think about that. And who you are, you're so self-absorbed when you're a teenager. You have blinders on mm -hmm. to the outside world. And these three young ladies got up there and not only did they read their victim impact statements, they looked the accused right in the eye and they spoke to him. And you know, the one that stuck with me, she looked right at him and said, I thought my life was going to be peaceful, but I guess that's just not the case anymore, is it? She's 15. She shouldn't, she should be self-absorbed. She should be thinking about what she's going to do this weekend mm -hmm. and, you know, people that she's interested in and friends and what are we doing this weekend? Mm -hmm. And, and yet they weren't, they've created an advocacy group, youth in action to against Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. And I just, and I don't know Tamara, if it's the cumulative effect that you talk so eloquently about, or if it's, I'm a mother of three teenagers, mm -hmm. I don't know what it was, but I was shaken after that. And I had to leave the courtroom to go and do what we do. And I had a, I call it the, the national loop. I had to hit on news channel, uh, CIFTO, uh, CTV News Toronto in their noon show, and then CP24. And as I was leaving, I, I bumped into the imam from London, who I've gotten to know on a first name basis because we have chatted over the weeks and months. And I said, I'd like you to relay a message because I'm always worried that they think I want an interview out of them. And I don't. Can you please tell them? I, I, I hear them. I these hear teenage girls. Say changed me and I'll never forget them. And I'm proud of them. I I'm not their mother. <laughs> I, you know, I've never met them, but I'm proud of them as a, as a woman and as a citizen, as a person, as a human being. And he's like, wait, right here, I'll go get them. And I said, no, no, it, no, I don't want, I just need you to tell them that I'm going to go outside and do my best to relay. No, no, they'll want to hear this for themselves. And so they came over and my hands were shaking and I could feel the tears and they came over and I just, cause I never know in, in that faith, um, men and women don't shake hands. Mm -hmm. um, women do, but i never, I didn't know. And so I just put my hand over my heart and just, like kind of, I said, I'm so proud of you. And I know that sounds dumb. And it was on a recess and so many members were in close proximity. And I was, I just, I was overcome with emotion and I did start to cry to the point I couldn't talk mm -hmm. and I was embarrassed and for a moment. And then I thought, no, like this is real emotion and I might be a reporter, but I'm allowed to feel. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought to myself, if somebody comes at me and says that that's me showing a bias, so be it. Because I was just overcome with emotion. And, and I, you know, I said to them, you are going places, you have a bright future. I wish we'd met under better circumstances, but I heard you. And the one girl said to me, thank God, somebody is listening. Somebody is hearing this. And so I left the courtroom and lots of people now had seen our interaction and kind of witnessed it. And I left and I went down to the live truck and I had to collect myself. I had like five minutes. Yeah. And like my what, hands what time shaking. was this at? Cause you're going live at noon, right? It would have been like 1150. Yeah. And I didn't want to be like, gotta go. I've got to go do more important things, but I had to leave because oh, no. I was going to, like, I was going to be sobbing. I, yeah. I, I couldn't even speak. But, and, but let, let's just talk about this. Let's just pause for a second, Michelle, because mm -hmm. like you, you're really bringing me back to being in court and having to round, run out and file. But it's not that you're just covering something. 
and you're running out to file. You're not at a school board meeting and running out to file. You're not, you're not covering a basketball game and running out to do a live hit. You are in a highly emotional situation. And, and this, um, this victim impact statement in particular, these, these girls, it sounds like they sort of became like a rallying call for you. And it's probably like everything from the last several weeks and months that had sort of come together. And this was, it sounds like this was sort of your outlet for that. So just I'm saying to my, to our listeners who are not journalists and a lot of people, a lot of journalists listen to this, but I've heard from a lot of people who are not journalists. Like just imagine that in, in a, you're in a very vulnerable moment. You are having a real human connection with somebody. You're feeling all these things, but you still have to be watching your watch, looking at your watch because it's 10 to noon and you've got to run out to the truck and go live. Like that is heavy. And that is like one of the parts of the job that, that, that are so harmful. And I don't know how we fix that because the shows are at this time and this time and this time and our, yeah. our deadlines are constant. But one of the detrimental parts of this job is that we don't have time to just sit with those emotions and think about what we just witnessed. And, and there's, um, there's a study that I reference on vicarious trauma when I do training on this stuff uh, that, that mentions that journalists that are, are, are at a high risk of developing vicarious trauma because they don't have time between witnessing an event and sharing that event with the world to just think about it as a human being. To just be in it. it. To just be in yeah. it, right? So you, so yeah. you run out to the truck and then, and what, t- tell me what it's like when you get to the truck. So I, I said to the awesome guy who was here from CIFTO, um, he was here to assist me, which was incredibly helpful. I didn't have to set the camera up myself. I didn't have to call in the IFB myself. Yes. And that's yeah, because how we Michelle is Michelle is you have we haven't mentioned this yet, but Michelle is a VJ, a video journalist who does everything for herself. So when she's <laughs> yeah. referring to the truck, the truck op coming down from CIFTO, which is in Toronto, you had extra resources there. Mm-hmm. But still, you've got 10 minutes to, to air help. time. Yeah. Yeah. So I just said, cause I kind of like blew into the live truck and closed the door behind me and he's like, are you okay? And I was like doing one of these, like my hands on the table, just in my head down. And I was like, I'm just going to need a minute. And he's like, take all the time you need. They'll wait. And I was like, he's probably right, but you do, you have to find it within yourself. And I know it's not healthy, but I call it, I just push the feelings down and focus Because at the end of the day, if I can't push my feelings down that I'm feeling right now and focus on my job, no one is ever going to know, not no one, because all the other media was there. I'm not implying that I'm the only Mm -hmm, one, mm -hmm. but now it's my responsibility to take what they said and to tell people to the viewers in the CTV network. And that's my job. And that's my role. And to say, I'm too emotional. I can't handle this you're going to have to push me off until 1230, which they won't do. No one is ever going to, the CTV viewers aren't going to know what these girls did. And that to me would have been a disservice to them. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't stand to have that. And so it's this quick, so it's almost good that the, you know, I can't go live from the courtroom Mm -hmm. because that walking out the elevator down, running around the building because access now to courthouses are very, they're not simple or easy. It allowed me that time to flip that switch, switch, push the feelings down and focus Mm -hmm. on what is my role and what is my job. Mm -hmm. And I did it and I did my loop and my parents who live in the Ottawa Valley and I have tons of family up in the Ottawa area. Anytime I'm on national news, they want to know. So we had a thread throughout the 11 weeks and I would say hitting at this time, here's my hit schedule. And they knew I was in London. My parents in particular had called me the night before checking in, want to make sure you're okay. Don't like the idea of you being in a hotel room by yourself. No problem. I was connecting with Jane. I was connecting with friends in London and afterwards, my mom, when I talked to her that night, at the end of the day, she said, we could tell you were emotional because we know you so well. And they, they noticed a real difference between the noon hits on the Friday versus the hits the entire other day. And then the hits um, 
that night on the Friday night, they could say, they, they said, you were clearly really emotional and now we're worried about you. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I'm very I, I, I remember I my family it. members saying the same thing to me yeah. about certain ones. Like, are you okay? Like you just seemed sad. And I would be like, well, mom, it was, it's a really sad story. It's super I'm not going to be smiling, but it's true. Like we feel these things. Right. And I mm-hmm. love that that truck operator, and I know who you're talking about because you mentioned his name in a previous conversation that we had. And this is a guy that has been in the business for, oh, I, I want to say close to 30, 30 at least. Maybe. Yeah, I think he's, yeah. He's been Might around be for a long time. Approaching 40. Yeah. And he's, and yeah. he's worked, um, behind the scenes he's worked sorry in the station he's worked on the trucks more recently and i'm so happy that he said that because that is a colleague to colleague a peer to peer saying like you we're here to i'm here to support you it's okay and he's and he's it's validating okay. your your feelings in that moment and i often talk about you know rushing rush because you're rushing from a scene to this to those interviews blah, 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 or the court to blah 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 to the the truck and you're going to pound it out and I often talk to people about how I'm like sitting there in the truck pounding out my script with like tears running down my face and and the truck operator sitting there and the camera guy because I didn't work as a VJ like you did is sitting mm-hmm. there and we're all just sort of sitting in this awful thing but you're just sort of like in robot mode it's weird right you're in robot mode but you're also just <clears throat> feeling all these feels yeah sort of yeah. it through, but everyone in there, and this is really what I wanted to show people with this season two of this podcast is everyone there is human and feeling human things, but you're in a job that forces you to like, your job is to be that messenger and you got to yeah. pull it together. Right. And there, are, and there are, there are downfalls to it, you know, cause that was what happened in the morning. Then what happened in the afternoon was more young people. And then um, the cousins of the little boy who was orphaned that day, he was protected from the court completely, which is a decision I 100% support. Mm -hmm. Um, His cousins, young people, got up in the witness box and stood all together with their hands on the shoulder of the cousin that read an 11-year-old's victim impact statement. You should not know what a victim impact statement is at 11. Yeah. And just, it's so uh, youthful, just yes. such an honest, and they don't get yes. into fancy descriptive words. It's just, this is this and that is that. Mm-hmm. I miss my sister. She was going to take me for drives when she got her license. She was only going to charge me 25 cents, Aww. which brought a moment of levity, mm-hmm. right? So that one was, excuse me, a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. By this point, I'm sitting in the back of the courthouse because again, I know I'm running out of time. The day is getting long. My hits are coming, my afternoon run. And then the woman, just a random Londoner, was driving in her community, saw this before first responders, before the paramedics, and went, oh my, what, what am I seeing? pulled over, could see the carnage, and could hear a young person calling for help. And so she went to him because he was the only one who could speak. The other family members were so incredibly hurt. And she went to him and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'm here for you. Can you hear the sirens? Focus on the the sirens are coming. Your family is going to be okay. And she told that court that she is haunted by lying to him. She knew she was lying to him. She's a mother of, I can't remember how many children she has, but that has changed her life. She is a victim. All of the other victims were family, friends, or members of the Muslim community. She had nothing to do with this other than She was a member of the London community that was traumatized by this and she can't work anymore. She's not the same mother. And she told the court all of these things. And I was sitting in the back. And like you say, you were in the truck crying and writing. I was sitting in the back of the courtroom, a family member or like an extended family member was on my right. 
Um, on my left was a gal I saw every day here in Windsor. She's a PhD student, I think from a school in Montreal, writing a thesis on extremism. And so we got to know each other through that. And I'm consoling her while I write notes with my right hand. And then family members over here had a box of Kleenex and I thought, don't ask them. It's rude to ask these poor family members. Poor you, Michelle, poor you, you need a Kleenex. And like, I needed a clean. And so I just said, I'm so sorry. Could you hand me that box? No problem. And then she's rubbing my back to console Aww. me. It, and I'm crying so much. It's dropping on my notepad and smearing my words. Again, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget that moment. And I remember thinking, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what else to do with all this. Mm -hmm. I was, I was full of emotion completely. My heart was heavy. My mind was full. I just, I've never felt like that in my entire life. Even when I've had, you know, I've been very, very lucky with personal trauma, very, very lucky. Um, and I can only akin it to that. Like when I've had a close family members die, that's the only, you're just full and you just, it's overwhelming. It's, it's it's hard to explain and I'm probably not doing a good job of it, but I love you, you, you are, time. you are. And, and cause I, like, I relate so much to what you're saying. I feel it so deeply, Michelle, I've been there. And, and then yet like you have, we're talking about 70 victim impact statements over two days. And you have how, like how much time did you have in your pack? Like the story that you were filing to, to tell you well, a couple stories, obviously. Yeah. But, and that was the other issue with that. Those particular occasions, my colleague was away on a vacation that was pre-planned before we, no one expected the sentencing this early. And so I kind of had to pick up sort of all of the work, mm -hmm. uh, TV, radio, web, and broadcast, which is why I got the resources from Toronto because they recognized that, I, that it was too much of a lift. Um, but I was given, how much time do you want? You take it. You take what you need. And so uh, as the day went on, I would just keep adding. So I, on the lunch break, after I did my hits, had a little cry, I worked my story and I was like, these are the three points I have to get to. I have to say this, do, 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 do. And then you just keep adding on to the end of the day. And um, so in some ways, I'm glad I felt it so emotionally because it dialed my brain into mm -hmm. what needed to be said mm -hmm. and what I had to get to and the points that people needed to know about the community impact on this. Um, but I mean, I am not ashamed to admit it. We, you were uh, working uh, that evening for News Talk 1010 mm -hmm. and you, we had chatted the day before and we had a plan mm -hmm. to chat that day at the end of the sentencing hearing and I bowed out of it. I mm -hmm. just, I felt, I felt like I had run a marathon. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a runner, so I know what that feels like. So maybe that's why I used that analogy, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. felt like I had pushed the feelings down and focused and I couldn't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, and you were so great about it, mm -hmm. acknowledging that that was my way of protecting myself mm -hmm. at the finish line. And I, I needed to write one more web article and then I could go home. Mm -hmm. to my family. And, you know, because you understand it, you said, I think it would be better if we didn't talk because like they were like, the emotions weren't here anymore. They mm -hmm. were like, I was drowning, above your eyeballs. Was drowning in sorrow. Yes. And uh, so I just want to give some context to that. So, um, for listeners that aren't aware, I do fill in hosting from time to time on uh, various radio shows. And yes, yeah, so I happened to be hosting on the Thursday night and the Friday night. And so on the Thursday night, the, the two days of the sentencing hearing, Michelle joined us to walk us through the victim impact statements of that day. And I, and I told you, Michelle, after we got off that call, like, Hey, I'm, I'm working tomorrow too. Absolutely no pressure. But if you want to talk about the victim impact statements tomorrow, like we can have you back on. And I think you said to me something like, for you, anything. And I'm like, no, like, no, you need it. If, I said, if you need it, you need it. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm like, this isn't, yeah. this isn't, um, 
what I need. It, it's how, if you feel like it, it would be helpful in any way, or um, you're up for it or whatever after your shift. And then we were sort of in touch throughout the day. And I was so grateful that you had that self-awareness and ability to advocate for yourself to say, you know what? No, I can't. Because if you weren't okay, I didn't want you on the air. That's, mm -hmm. that's Tamara of today. Tamara of five years ago, well, before I was even thinking of this stuff, would have said like, okay, we got to get a hit from the reporter who's there and we need to know what, you know, and, and indeed like some of the people that I was working with on the radio show, they're, they're like, oh yeah, we're, they had actually put it into the sked. I don't remember if I told you that, but I'm like, they, no. they put, they put it into the sked that we were talking to you. And I'm like, guys, we might not be talking to her. We need to see how it goes and how she's doing and everything like that. They're like, oh, well, oh. we, we need, this is the biggest story of the day. We need to talk about it. I'm like, I can talk about it. Um, I I've read her tweets all day. I've been following the news reports. I can talk about it. We don't need this reporter who's been sitting in this all day. Who's been filing hit after hit after hit. We actually don't need her to tell this story. And so we didn't, and it was fine, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I wish that we did that more in this industry because, you know, I talk to a lot of people about how we take, take, take people's stories of trauma. We take their stories, right? Yep. But we also take a lot from our peers, from our employees, from, from journalists, like, mm -hmm. and, and it's a lot because then like you just, just not having that time to decompress. And I mean, we could talk about resources and everything like that. Like there's a reason that we're so busy on this job. It's because there's not a reporter from every affiliate who's there yeah. covering it. So you, you become that reporter who's covering it for everybody. We'll be right back. So I wonder like Michelle, like what, what does self care look like for you? Mm. You've talked a lot about a like, your brain filling with this stuff. How do you take care of mm -hmm. all that stuff in your brain? How do you mm -hmm. rinse it out and release it from your body? Yeah. Um, I think it was, you know, I spoke at the beginning about one trial in particular that really bothered me. And I remember being at my son's baseball game and a mom asked me, how's it going at that trial? And I just like went off talking about it. And then she kind of got a look on her face and I looked around and went, wow, this is not the place to be talking about something so gory. And that was the first time that I really was like, just because people ask you doesn't mean you need to get into the nitty gritty. And maybe this is you need to talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the first time where I realized that things are affecting you and you need to find a way to work through it. And so over the years, um, uh, I've renewed my, um, I guess, love of running. I've always been a runner. I kind of quit in the middle sort of when I was in college for sure. When I first started, my now husband and I would run together before we had kids, but then we had kids and da 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 da. da. And you don't, you put yourself last, right? You know, especially once you become a mom and a wife, you sort of put yourself last. And um, I renewed my interest in it kind of around the time of that trial, now that I think back. Mm -hmm. Um, and so running has been my outlet. And then running with uh, one of my colleagues here during the pandemic when we were allowed to be together was a lifesaver for both of us. And we go on these like crazy long runs and we don't even listen to music in particular during COVID because we weren't seeing each other and we weren't seeing anybody. And um, we would just go for these long runs and we would stop and look at our watches and say, oh my goodness, we've been running for an hour and wow. we've both been talking. And so running for me is a very big outlet. But my other big outlet is, quite frankly, my husband. Um, he is better to me than I deserve sometimes. You know, reporters, we're a lot to live with. We're the only spouses who give our spouse heck for not taking a picture of the accident they stumble across <laughs> or not calling in, you know, yeah. not calling it in when they get yeah. evacuated from Walmart, which happened a couple of weeks ago. Oh my gosh. Um, he now calls me, oh, we're being evacuated. You might want to find, right? Yeah. Um, he is really great every day asks me, how was your day? What was your story? And some days I don't want to talk about it. And other days I talk about it. And then um, my other outlet is my kids and um, talking to them about the stories, 
particularly ones that I think they need to know about or ones that they might be interested in. It's mm. a great find a find common ground with your teenagers is like when there's a big story that they know about or they'll say to me, hey, mom, did you cover this story? I didn't because it's not local. It's something off TikTok or whatever. <laughs> but so I think that those are my outlets. And then I also talk about my parents and my parents are a great outlet as well. Um, I think they are for everybody. I don't think I'm unique in that sense, but my parents are very, um, uh, a very, like a very big part of my life, even though I live eight hours away from them. Mm -hmm. Um, I see them a lot can, you know, considering the distance. And so I lean on my family a lot. Um, in particular, after they've seen me on TV and we'll talk afterwards and, you know, it's always to me when I know I need to call my mom and talk to her when I just, I need someone to talk me off the ledge sometimes just about, I know it's a terrible expression, but just to refocus my mind about what really matters and mm -hmm. what's really important. And my mom in particular uh, made the comment, well, I hope the next time you do a national story, it's something positive because I never see you smile on TV. And you referenced that before. My mom has said the true. same thing to me. Yes. You have such a pretty smile and I never get to see it. And so I always try to half smile when they're throwing to me. And when I throw back to whoever I'm hitting mm -hmm. with, just as a kind of, it's okay, okay, mama, I'm still here. I'm still me. I'm okay. It is hard. You know, if you have a big goofy grin, like I do at times, it's hard to you can't overdo it, but at the <laughs> yeah. same time, you do want to smile and acknowledge, mm -hmm. you know, so I guess it's a long answer. I apologize, but no, that good. is where, what little bit of self-care I do. I know I need to do more, but, um, those are the things that I do to keep my mind straight. Mm -hmm. Well, there is like research has shown the value of those healthy relationships, like for, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> for trauma exposed professionals in particular, whose job, like you're exposed to trauma all the time to have that healthy home base or like the healthy friend relationships or your partner or your parents. And you and I are so similar, Michelle, when I was working in Toronto, like so much of my day quite often was spent driving either to and from scenes or between at the scene right. headquarters or back to the station. Cause traffic was awful there. And more often than not, when I was driving, unless I was making calls for the story, which was quite often, um, I was mm -hmm. on the phone with my family because I drove myself around and my family lived in Saskatchewan. I was in Ontario. And I was talking to my mom, talking to my sisters, my dad, my brother, like all day, and sometimes talking about the story, but usually just talking. And really they were an anchor for me. And then I would go home and, you know, you talked about that taking, like having to walk around the courthouse and that, that period of time that you got between the story and the truck and being able to sort of pull yourself together, my drives home talking to my family, because I was usually spending 45 minutes to an hour, if not more driving right. home right. um, from either police headquarters or a scene to my home in Ajax. Um, that was where I sort of collected myself. And sometimes I would sort of sit in my car on the driveway after a really hard day and just like need to cry a little bit or take a few breaths and pull myself together and then walk inside. And sometimes before seeing my kids, I would just need to like hug my husband. I just, I remember so distinctly, just like putting my face in into his sweater one day and just crying and just saying like, it was a hard day. And then just taking a few breaths and then turning around and being mom, you know, and it brings yeah. tears to my eyes right now, because then it's like, what did I do then? Then I I did the mom stuff like on the nights that I was able to see my kids before they went to bed. And then I woke up in the morning, I exercised and that was really an outlet for me and just rinsed and repeated. Right. But for me, started like, all, all over those, again, all of those mm -hmm. um, memories, it turned out were sort of going somewhere. We both, both talked about being a mom. And I want to talk to you about that because what something you mentioned in previous conversation we had was uh, a line about being that weird reporter mom did, did becoming a mother um, change you, do you think, in terms of how these stories, some of these stories impact you? Yes. I think it changed me in, in two ways for the better. I think on one hand, it made me a better reporter because I have more confidence. 
in myself and um what, like because when I think about how hard it is to be a mom it's, I mean it's the greatest thing you'll ever do um I, I realized that you know you can do pretty amazing things when you think about things that you sort of overcome as a mom and, and just the grind of it all. And I mean, in hindsight, I should have been talking to someone about postpartum with my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time, me and my family, my family and I, my mom would be so annoyed if I got that grammar wrong. <laughs> <laughs> my family and I were very, we wear our heart on our sleeve. We're very, we're cuggers. We're very, you know, all in family means everything. But at the end of the day, we're, you put your head down and you get through it. You don't have a pity party. You have a job, you get paid to do it. So go and do it. Mm. And motherhood was very much like that. This is your job. Now you need to take care of her and she's number one. And then he's number one. And then he's number one. And Mm. so in hindsight, I probably should have and could have talked to someone just about how I was feeling and the ups and downs and you know, it's craziness. So when I came back after having my babies and my poor employer, because it, every two years I was gone for six years, because we Same just me. We wanted yeah, three exactly. kids and we just Same. wanted yeah. to start and get it done. Yes. And so by the time I came back and said, you're good, I'm done. I refocused on my career and I found that I was more confident and I had a thicker skin when you would make a cold call and a pharmacy would say they're not interested in doing this story. Okay, no problem. Mm-hmm. Bye. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'll go on to the next one. Or when you try to do a man on the street and you're interviewing people and they would, they're they're the worst. And they they act like you're invisible. You're standing on the side of my head. And you're just just like, whatever, man, I don't care. Yeah. (laughs) So I found like being a mom made me a better reporter on the flip side. It also exposed, it exposed my heart to other people's suffering and it, and it, I, I don't look at the same stories the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a very hard time with impaired driving because my teenagers, in particular, when my teenagers started to get into that world and I go home and tell them, I did a story today, a two-year-old kid is dead and the mom is seriously injured because a man got behind the wheel, had a couple drinks. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did this story. Mm-hmm. Best friend killed her friend because they mm-hmm. had a couple. I know, mom, I mm-hmm. know. But do you? And yeah. so those, those, and so it changed, it made me a better reporter, but it also exposed that, um, I don't want anybody to report on my kids yes. about this way. Yeah. And it exposes a lot of conflicts because we do a lot of stories about the school system. We do a lot of stories about minor sports and all of my kids are heavily involved in minor sport. Mm. And then, you know, people will say, well, there's this story that's coming out of your league can you make a call about it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that person. Mm -hmm. I have their cell phone because they coached my son. Mm -hmm. So, but do you want to be wearing your reporter hat in that relationship? Exactly. And then when it's an issue that involves an entire league, like that for me directly affects me and my family and so I don't want to talk about that story Mm -hmm. but there might be a perception by other people in your newsroom that well you're just Mm -hmm. being lazy or you're not working your contacts but then you have to find that balance between is this a contact Mm -hmm. that I generated through court Mm -hmm. I have a lot of lawyers cell phone numbers and I can just call them up and be like this is a cell phone number I got because they're friends of my son or they're friends of my daughter. And, and it's very uncomfortable as a journalist hey. stepping out of the, you wear these different hats. Like, and that's what we're mm-hmm. used to doing, right? You go home, you put on your mom hat, you go to work, you put on your journalist hat and that is sort of becomes our armor. And that's what allows us to cover a lot of the things that we cover, especially when we're talking about trauma, because I'm not Tamara, the mom, I'm not Michelle, the mom right now. Yeah. I am Michelle, the reporter, um, even though and I'm going to be know, strong, true, and- right? Yeah, firm, we're, we're and just, I'm we're not going to have an opinion. And it's not going to get to me. <laughs> yeah, right. <sighs> but then you're in the middle of a court case, and your son texts you, "Mom, I need da 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 da," and you're thinking, "Okay, I I got to deal with this." But I'm, and I will say, we're not special as reporter moms in yes. that respect. Like yeah. moms, the world over are sort of walking this fine line. Mm-hmm. The difference is, is we do have. Um, 
an outward job that people can see what we do. And, you know, a lot of people think that my kids think it's cool that their mom is on TV. And more often than not, they're like, yes, that's where my mom works, you know, because yes. it, so it, it is a, it is a challenge being that weird reporter mom. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it's also helpful because I, I, and this is a goal for me this year is finding that next demographic. Mm-hmm. They're not watching the yes. six o'clock news, mm-hmm. right? Our demographic is aging out and yeah. they're on. You said your kid asking you if you covered the TikTok story. And then I'm I'll sure tell them, get their news. I'm so excited when I go home and say, I did a story that I found off TikTok and I'm so <laughs> proud of myself. You know? <laughs> Amazing. And, yeah. And the first day of the, of the trial that we've been talking so much about, my yeah. son sent me a screen grab and he's like, mom, you made TikTok. Oh, like, oh my gosh. I love that. Day. That's good. <laughs> exactly. So. It's, it, it gives you some levity, right? Um, mm-hmm. Michelle, like I, I ask a, a lot of journalists there and usually the answer is the same, but for you, like in journalism school, in the course of your career, you've covered so much trauma, but did you ever learn about trauma officially ever? Do you recall ever taking a course or, yeah. or is it and sort so, of like um, you learn it on the job? Like that's how I felt as a journalist. Yeah. And that's no criticism of the Fanshawe College program. It's been almost know, it's everywhere though. years since I was there. Yeah. So maybe they do now. I don't yeah. know. And it's not a criticism of my employer. Mm -hmm. Quite frankly, Tamara, when I started, we didn't talk about mental health. It wasn't a story. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something we talked about. And that's not to say that I couldn't have, but you just sort of thought, well, this is just part of the job. And for the longest time, I always see the viewfinder as my filter, as my mental health filter. Mm. And when you go to a scene and you see a tarp, you learn very quickly Mm -hmm. that that means that someone is deceased wherever you are. And that's why that's there. And you learn very quickly when a scene is tense and things might go sideways. And I was always able to see the viewfinder as that distance. And I remember coming back years ago and someone was in my edit bay with me looking at it and they said, well, you look at right there, you can see some, you can see the person's foot. No, how did I? And they would say, my husband or somebody said to me, how did you not know you were getting video of a foot? And I was thinking in thirds. Mm -hmm. I was shooting in thirds. I was shooting without headroom. I was making sure my audio was there. Mm -hmm. I was doing a pan that moved and stopped and then panned back and stopped for five seconds. And so for the longest time, I felt like my camera was my filter. My camera was protecting me and shielding me from what my heart and my head shouldn't or couldn't process. And then the whole conversation started about mental health. And I do now have almost unlimited resources that is offered by the company that is offered in my Mm -hmm. community. Because as journalists, the other thing I like to say is we know a little bit about a lot of things, but we're a master of nothing. Mm -hmm. And I know resources in my community. I know hundreds of people that I could call and say, I'm not in a great place today. Do you have five minutes to talk? Reporters, uh, therapists, people from Canadian Mental Health Association, people from our local hospital. And, And so it has evolved over time. Did I have specific training? No, not a criticism of the program, but that's, it's, it's like you never had to shoot everything. I've only Mm -hmm. ever had to shoot Mm -hmm. everything because our industry has evolved, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm at a small station. You were at the bee's knees, the big machine, Mm -hmm. the cats, you know, Mm -hmm. well, they're all BJs now. are the most of them are BJs now, yeah. But we we started yes. here. We yeah. were like on the ground floor, and it's moved through the system. Quite yeah. frankly, this whole conversation about trauma informed reporting, about mental health, is moving through the system mm-hmm. as our industry evolves and as that conversation evolves. Mm-hmm. We've talked a lot about the mental health of reporters, Michelle. And one thing I'll point out is, like you and I first met, I think. Um, a couple of years ago when I was supporting a family in Windsor, homicide survivors, 
um, with media for the, a media campaign that they were part of. And you and I had a yep. conversation and I remember, um, I don't remember if it was something that you said, but I just remember being felt being left with the feeling that this is a reporter that really cares about getting it right for this family. And, and I know a lot of reporters who are like that, but you, you really cared about not causing further harm to the family. And we've had mm. conversations since then about various things that you've covered. And I know that you really care, like you do not want to cause further harm, but there are things that we do in this industry that people look at us and say, you're a vulture, you're an ambulance chaser. Why? How are you knocking on that yep. door? How are you going up to that? How do you sleep at night? Exactly. How do you live with yourself? Yes. Yep. And something I often say to reporters is you cannot adequately take care of yourself unless you're taking care of the people you're reporting on. What do you think, like what sort of conversations first, I guess I would ask you, do you agree with that? And, and then the second part of the question is like, what sort of conversation would you want to have with your younger self about trauma and covering trauma and the lessons that you've learned and, and how to go about doing this job? Do you think that there's anything you'd want to tell your younger self? Because both you and I came up during a time where we didn't talk about trauma. We didn't know about these mm. things. And so you know, you have a playbook and you're told to go do X, Y, and Z. And even though you have the best of intentions, now we know that some of that stuff can be harmful, right? It's harmful. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think I would go back and tell my younger self, it's okay to have a heart and it's okay to show compassion. It costs me nothing to be kind. And I think I wouldn't go into those door knocking, reach out to the family conversations with quite such a hard edge. And um, nobody likes to do it. I don't know any reporter who wants to talk to a family member when they've lost a loved one in a traumatic way. And so um, I've sort of uh, found a way and maybe I do it to make myself feel better. But I, I approach families and say, listen, I don't want to just talk about how your loved one died. Let's talk about how they lived. You talk about how they lived. You show me who they really were other than this, quite frankly, 10 minute window in their life. And, you know, we've covered people who were in a bad place. They were running with the wrong people. They were somewhere they probably shouldn't have been, but for parents, for loved ones, that's not the story for them. And because forgiveness is a powerful, powerful thing. And it's okay to let families have forgiveness. What does it matter? What does it change? It doesn't change the story. And so I think I would tell my younger self, it's okay to have a heart. It's okay if they tell you, if they call you every name in the book. It's okay if they say, yes, I'll do an interview with you at four o'clock. And then they cancel at the last minute. Don't, don't take that personally. Don't get upset. They're not an elected official. They don't have to talk to me. And the worst thing I can do and young journalists can do is retaliate against that family member. If they promised an interview and then they said, no, grief is a funny thing. And the stages of grief are even weirder mm -hmm. and give them that space because quite frankly, you get more by being kind and polite and social and it starts with hello good morning at the courthouse and it morphs into just finding an opportunity when you can say to them my name is Michelle I'm with CTV if you ever want to talk you let me know you tap me on the shoulder I'm willing to do that story and walk away don't like, don't hit them. I'm with CTV and I'm this and I'm that. And I, 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 that's your problem. It's not about you. It's not about what you want to do for your job. You need to put the effort in, but don't beat a dead horse. If they say no, if they don't make eye contact, leave it alone. To me, those kinds of things are what got us those interviews when people show, open their heart to us. And people ask me all the time, what, what's your favorite story to do? And what kind of famous people have you met? And da, 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 da. And I always come back to it. And maybe it's not the answer people want. My favorite stories are the average people opening up about their grief and their trauma and being brave 
to talk to me about something that I'm not sure I could survive. Mm. And so I think that's what I would tell my younger self. And at that trial, at the last sentencing hearing, um, I got to know the family from being in court with them kind of every day and giving them their space. And they came up to me afterwards and said, we've written a statement about the apology that the offender just gave. And I said, this is, wow, this is powerful stuff. Do you want to say it? Well, we don't want to take any questions. I said, I don't blame you on that. I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just come out and you say it? It's more impactful if you say it versus me reading. Okay. But as long as we're not asked any questions, it's like, you come out, you read right from this piece of paper and walk away. And if any of them start asking questions, just walk away from us. Because we sometimes don't know to look a gift horse in the mouth. What more do we want than a family reading from a prepared statement about how they feel? And so afterwards, I, I gave them a hug because I thought this might be the last time I see you. And and then like the national media was all there and they all saw it. And I wasn't ashamed. I don't care because again, it costs me nothing to be kind to these poor people whose lives have been exposed forever, forever. People will know the name of the Afsal family and that's not gonna change. So, you know, I, I get that, you know, people think that we are vultures and we are to a certain extent to try to get that trauma, but I know the story that I want to put to air is here. This is how they're feeling. Present, past, future mm -hmm. is how I write up most of my stories. Here is how this mother is feeling today. Here's why. The bulk of the story is who they were in life. And here's where we're going to mm -hmm. go for the future in them mm -hmm. seeking justice and whatnot. And so I think if you want people to care about the news that's happening in their community, you have to get them to empathize, mm -hmm. to sympathize, not pity, but mm -hmm. to empathize with this mother whose child was killed by an impaired driver to spark a conversation at home with your drivers. And maybe, again, maybe I'm saying all this to make me feel better. That's why I do those door knocking. That's why mm -hmm. I try to get families because it's not just about how someone died. It's how they live. How else could you get those interviews or how else could you know if a family wants to talk because you just said I guess to an extent we are vultures in the way we do things what would help you because I talk a lot about the fact yeah that I, I don't think this should all be on journalists there's a lot of people that need to play into this what would an ideal world look like for you when tragedy strikes and you want to know if that family is talking what would the most ideal situation look like for you because you like you said you, you don't like going and knocking on those doors or calling through that no phone one call. does we don't enjoy it um Frankly, I think it's a place where the police could be uh, the media relations officers with the police departments, recognizing that it's not the job of the detectives to be that conduit. Um, but I just liken it to when there's a missing person, numerous occasions, Windsor police have a, set up a news conference with a loved one. It doesn't need to be the wife, the mother, the husband, it can be a great aunt. It can be a family friend. It can be a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Someone tied to make people think just a little bit longer about that story. And I think it's a failing, quite frankly, of law enforcement. I think it should be a role of the media relations officer that every police force now has. And um, you made a good point, quite frankly, and I'll say it in case you don't, that it could be a place where victim services, once we get into the court process, I think it should be one of the things that they go through with the family members. Listen, the media is going to be here. How do you want to deal with it? And I think they could be the conduit. And so I think that there's two different places and potentially long shot, potentially the Crown Attorney's Office could afford to have a media relations person, quite frankly, just in getting us information so we get it right and don't make mistakes. Yes. And secondly, to not bombard family members in and out of court. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reluctance on all of those agencies is that we won't listen, is that they'll have that conversation for us. They will relay it to us. And because we're cynics, we won't think that they actually asked them and we'll still ask the family anyways. Mm -hmm. 
that may be the case with some people. It's not what myself or any of my colleagues would do. We would recognize that the ask has been made, Mm -hmm. leave it alone. And then, and then it is the role of the journalist Mm -hmm. to create that relationship. Well, any of the reporting and journalism is relationship building. Mm -hmm. Any of the work that I've done um, supporting homicide survivors, for example, with the media, every journalist I talk to is grateful to have somebody there acting as that go between Yep. like, thank you for doing this. I hate reaching out to families. I never know if they want to talk. I'm so happy that there's someone here that can just tell me, no, they don't want to take questions or yes, you can talk to them, but don't talk about X, Y, and Z because that will be harmful. Um, We just need Mm -hmm. to make it systemic. I think Um, Michelle, Mm -hmm. I know I'm keeping you so long and you, let's just say it is a news day that we're talking and you're actually (laughs) telling a story today. Is there anything um, that we haven't talked about that you'd like to touch on in, in terms of anything you'd like people to know about? journalists, trauma, how you do your job. I think you've done such a, an excellent job um, articulating so many important points. I think, I suppose the only thing that um, I wish more people knew is um, we're not the enemy. And um, we have an Im- important role to, to play. And it's not just because it's my career and I, like, I'm not going anywhere. There's, this is what I will do until the day I choose to retire. We're not the enemy. We can be, we can be a very great asset to any community. And, um, and we're also like, we're human beings as well. And um, if we make a mistake, we're okay to have that conversation and make that correction. But in a world where people can um, attack, criticize, accuse without coming up to me face to face, I think that's become an even greater source of um, reluctance on people to enter this industry. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for us. And I just, I I want people to give us the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. We're not terrible people. And the people who, the reporters who are, in my opinion, bad reporters are the ones who will stick it to you. They want to do gotcha journalism. Maybe like click on their bio about where they are and see how much they've moved around. And if they move around from community to community and um, maybe not necessarily platform because our world is evolving, but if they're the kind of people that are moving around a lot, that should tell you a lot about the kind of reporting that they're doing. Someone who is in a community for an extended period of time understands that you breach confidence or you do bad reporting, you're not gonna last long. Mm -hmm. You're certainly not gonna get good stories and you're not gonna get good relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess that's the one thing is that we're not the enemy and We've been made to be the enemy in recent years without delving into that whole, Mm -hmm. you know, kettle of fish, but um, we aren't the enemy. We're good people and we're very passionate about what we do. And um, with really funny senses of humor, you know, we're really fun people to be around. Mm -hmm. Um, It can be a bit dark at times. (laughs) It's a survival um, mechanism. It is. And, but we're just, um, we're really passionate about what you do. And I think that's what the world is missing in the workplace is people who are passionate about it and they're not there for the vacation and they're not there for the crazy big pay. And they're not there for the perks. They're there because they like to tell stories and they want to meet people. Mm -hmm. And, um, I will forever be passionate about reporting and I'm proud of the work I do. I'm proud of the work that my colleagues do. And I'm proud of the work that every journalist does in the current environment. I'm curious to see where we're going to go. I don't know where we're going to be in 10 years when I'm ready to retire. And I'm looking forward to being there. And one final thing I do want to say is um, I'm proud of someone like you who has done this job, has walked in my shoes, and has been self-aware enough to um, take it and make something better and change the world for the better in a, in a, in a really unique way. And 
I think it's great what you do and the effort that you're making to make the world a better place. I don't think I do that. And I know oh, that you do. And you're doing it I'm right now, say, Michelle. You're doing it right yeah, now. I'm proud to say that I know you. And I just, mm -hmm. I think I, I, it's, it's another example of we're, we're really great people and just give us, give us your time and we can show you that, you know, we're, we're really interesting people to get to know. And so I'm thrilled to have been on this podcast. I know I talked way too long. No, not at but, all. I'm so grateful um, for you, Michelle. And I'm so proud to know you and so grateful to have you in my life and to have you as a journalist, as somebody who now does a lot of work supporting trauma survivors with the media. I am grateful to know that there is a reporter in Windsor, Ontario, who, if there is a trauma survivor who comes to me from there, I can I can hand them over to you with confidence that they'll be cared for by somebody yeah. who has a heart um, and who, yeah, who, who's looking out for their best interest, truly. So thank you so much. And thank you so much for your thank kind you. words. And I can't end this call without asking you to show me your big goofy grin that your mom would like <laughs> to see more. There it is. That's it. Yes, I love it. <laughs> The big goofy Thank grin. Thank you for anybody listening. <laughs> Especially when you actually put beautiful. lipstick on. It's like, oh, <laughs> so ridiculous. Yes, anyway, exactly. There's the big goofy grin for my mom. Hi, mom. Thank you, Michelle. I always forget that. Michelle Molesky. Yeah, so Thank I'm you. Thank you.